Let me also give a shout out to the entire team at Maryland Nonprofits, including our CEO, Heather Eilith, as well as the entire board of directors for their commitment to equity and support of this series. Thank you also to our sponsor, Care First, for their support of this webinar series. We also appreciate each one of you for spending the next 75 minutes with us. And if you haven't already, please visit our website for professional development opportunities and updates and even more information about events like today's webinar. There are several upcoming events around leadership, strategy, financial management, and so much more. In addition, we'll have more, strat more sessions in this series to talk about equity. Please also keep in mind that the Maryland Nonprofits team stands ready to assist you with your consulting, whatever your professional development needs might be. And so now let us get ready um, to welcome our panelists. We're excited today um, to welcome three amazing experts. Um, Azure Grimes, who is the Project Coordinator for Libraries Without Borders, Dr. Sasanya Jones, Assistant Professor at Howard University, and also Dr. Brenda Kelly, a Resource Specialist at the District of Columbia Public Schools. Welcome, ladies. Would you all turn your, um, your video and your audio on and also just wanted to remind you that um, this session is being recorded and the slides as well as the recording will be available following this webinar next slide please so i'm going to ask each um, panelist to introduce themselves starting with azure then dr uh, jones then dr kelly um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what brings you to the work today Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Azure Grimes. The pronouns I use are she, her, and I am the Baltimore Project Coordinator for an organization called Libraries Without Borders. We are an international nonprofit dedicating to increasing access to information in equitable ways to communities in most need. Um, we have several locations um, in about nine states around the country, um, and I serve as our Baltimore Project Coordinator for a program called the Wash and Learn Initiative. This initiative, we partner with the Enoch Pratt Free Library, nonprofit organizations like the Cash Campaign of Maryland, and other groups to create micro libraries inside laundromats. And so I'm very excited to be talking about digital equity. I'm very excited to talk about equity in general. I was born and raised in West Baltimore, so I'm all about Baltimore City. And I'm looking forward to talking more in depth about the ways in which we could get reconnected in Baltimore City, as well as in other spaces around the country. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Azure. Dr. Jones? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Sasanya Jones. I'm an assistant professor at Howard University within the Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Department. Um, and I've been studying and working as an administrator and teaching um, related to issues on equity, especially as it pertains to black and brown college students um, in higher education for over 15 years now. And so I'm really interested in not only what we can do in the classroom, but what we can do outside of the classroom and in areas of policy um, to better support um, our black and brown students, not only their, their experience in college, but those of, who are being shut out of college and the colleges that serve them. So I'm really happy today to talk about COVID and its impact on the community because um, I think it's exacerbating some inequities that we need to talk about. Um, and so thank you for having me. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Dr. Kelly? Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Brenda Kelly, and I come today with 40 years of teaching, um, actually 40 years of learning, because my students teach me every day. Uh, I, I come to this because I feel I have the ability to build community uh, where parents, school, and students are all equal stakeholders in the learning process. There have been many changes over my 40 years of teaching in policies, in programs, in curriculums, but one thing remains the same, and that is children 
and they just want to know that you care. So I am here um, just to offer some uh, tips on helping our communities to work closer together with getting our children to be where they need to be. Thank you again for Care First and also the sponsors and partners. I, I just appreciate being a part of this panel. So thank you very much. Looking forward to a great time together. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Um, so now um, I'll, I'll ask um, um, Dr. Jones and um, Dr. Kelly, if you would mute yourselves, uh, take yourselves off video. And I would ask Azure Grimes, if you would go ahead and um, lay the foundation for this conversation and let's get started. Let's do it. All right, so hi everyone. Uh, like I mentioned before, my name is Azure Grimes and I am the Baltimore Project Coordinator for Libraries Without Borders. And today we're gonna be talking about digital unification within the digital divide. Um, next slide, please. And so the purpose of this presentation today is to try to one, figure out what the current landscape is specifically in Baltimore City when it comes to digital equity or digital inequity. Two, how it is uh, specifically related to education, but not just education, but a lot of factors within our lives, within our industries that the digital divide impacts. Three, who exactly does it impact? Who are the people left behind? Who are the people that are advancing forward and why? And then with uh, the final couple minutes, we're gonna talk about some major takeaways and what are some simple ways to get digitally equitable um, and create a, a more digitally inclusive environment throughout COVID-19 and beyond. Uh, next slide, please. So the ABLE Foundation this Monday uh, released this report about um, the digital divide within Baltimore City. And so all the numbers that you see here are from 2018. And so this doesn't account for the current COVID-19 pandemic numbers, and we're still currently gathering data around that impact. But I want you to take a look at two specific pieces about the digital divide. Um, one is how many people have access to devices. So that means smartphones, tablets, laptops, and desktops. And then two, who has access to wireline internet. And so I'm defining wireline internet as having an internet subscription, either with Comcast, Verizon, Xfinity, and then having it installed directly into your residence. And so if you take a look at the numbers here uh, on the left-hand side, there are a total of around 240,000 households in Baltimore City. And so if you look at this number right here, it shows that 75,000 of those households currently lack a device or a desktop, a laptop at home. So what does that mean? That means that without access to a laptop with a wider screen or a desktop at home, you are limited to using mobile devices to get most of your work done. And so as we know, smartphones and mobile form phones are super handy. And I know that before I leave the house, I have to make sure I have my keys, my wallet, and my phone. Without my phone, I don't know what I'm gonna do with my day. Um, and so with this over-reliance on smartphones, we're seeing that it's harder and harder to get access to an actual device. And so let's break down these numbers. Who exactly are the people that are lacking a, a laptop or a desktop at home? Well, out of these 75,000 households, 20,000 of these households include youth under the age of 17. So about a third of those houses um, have children. And so the average household in Baltimore has around two children uh, in each household. And so if we consider that if a household is an intergenerational model, right? We have the grandparents, maybe we have the parent, we maybe got a friend and a roommate and we have the youth we're experiencing entire households that are either having one single device to share amongst households and amongst folks within the same residence, or we're seeing no devices at all. Um, and so um, this broken down even further, we'll see that the people most impacted by having a lack of device are those within the lower half of the city's income distribution. So that means if you're making around $25,000 a year, there is an 80% chance that you'll be without your own laptop or desktop. And so moving through to the lack of internet access, we see that there are about 96,000 households without it. And so not having a reliable internet connection means that they're relying on places like the public library, schools, uh, and restaurants to connect to their Wi-Fi that might not be as strong and might not have the bandwidth to handle um, a lot of devices getting connected. And so 19,200 of these homes that lack wireline internet um, live and have youth that live within the household. And so throughout 
this uh, study and throughout my own personal experience navigating different communities, we said there's a lot of overlap between those that have internet access and then those that have devices and then those that have no internet at home or no devices at home. It's very challenging to do both. And so within the lack of wireline internet, we see that 60% of these homes are within the lower 40% of the city's income. So we're seeing that those folks that are making around $25,000 a year are the same ones uh, that aren't connecting to wireline internet. And there are a lot of reasons why wireline internet um, is a challenge for families to uh, get. One, because of Baltimore's current infrastructure. Um, we have a lot of big corporations. We have a lot of companies that are here to provide internet, but it might not be affordable. And so if you're a family of four and you're deciding between whether you want to pay $200 a month for internet access or $200 for groceries, you're probably going to pick groceries. And so that means that within that month or so, you might be um, sharing the same device, sharing the same connection. And it's really, really inconvenient, especially during these times when we're forced to shelter at home. And so let's break down even deeper who are the folks that have internet access and internet and wireline internet and those without internet access or wireline internet. And so we see that a majority of uh, white populations own a laptop and desktop and have wireline internet. And so as we break it down by race, we see that black and brown folks are the ones that are in need of the most access, not only to laptops, but wireline internet. I want to make it clear that this is not an accident. It is not an accident that black and brown communities are without digital access and are left out of the conversations when it comes to digital equity. One, because if you're familiar with Baltimore City, you're familiar with the black butterfly and then the white L. The black butterfly, if you're not familiar, is a congregation of black and brown communities that are within the center of the city. Um, and that black butterfly, you'll primarily find the same zip codes that have health inequity, uh, food deserts, and all these other challenges and constraints to finding success. And then the white owl are the more affluent, majority white populations that have greater access to these tools. And so if I was like a tech wizard and I had a fancy map that could outline the black butterfly to those without internet access, we'll see a strong overlap. And that is not a mistake. Redlining has a lot of impacts, not only financially, economically, economically and literacy wise, but also digitally. And so we're seeing the impact of that black butterfly expand to deeper areas and seep into other industries. So let's be clear when we're talking about the digital equity and the digital divide in Baltimore City, black and brown communities are the ones most at risk for not getting connected. And so next slide, please. So how does this affect education? There's this uh, conversation happening called the homework gap. And so the homework gap is when uh, families and households that have kids that also have internet, also have a device are more likely to succeed than families and households with children that don't have internet and don't have computer access. And so we see this gap in that those students that have those resources and have access to that are more successful. And so if we're looking at um, the numbers right here, nationally, about 17% of US students do not have access to computers. And this is from a recent study in 2015 through the Pew Research Center. Um, in Baltimore City, if we break that down even more, right, if there are around two children per household, that means around 38,000 children in Baltimore City live in homes with no wireline and broadband access. And so those numbers don't even include those children that are without devices, but as you can imagine, it's probably a little bit larger than that, um, especially when we have households that are sharing devices. Um, and so if you're relying on public Wi-Fi, if you're relying on affordable Wi-Fi and you're kind of sheltered at home um, and you're not an essential worker, where are you gonna go for Wi-Fi? You cannot go to your local uh, libraries unless you have transportation and you can use or drive in Wi-Fi. Uh, you can't go to schools because schools are shut down until you know it reopens. So there aren't a lot of free public Wi-Fi spaces for families to connect to. And then if you don't have a reliable transportation, you are also at a disadvantage. Um, and so when we look at literacy rates in Baltimore City, it's not a surprise that the same neighborhoods that are impacted by food deserts, that are impacted by socioeconomic issues, that are challenged with racial inequity, um, are the same communities that have lower literacy rates. And so this is all interconnected. Um, the next piece when it comes to education is device sharing. As I mentioned, um, there are, I've been hearing more and more stories of families sharing one or two laptops amongst four or five people. And so if you are a parent and you work from home, if you have two children and they're going to school at home, if you got grandma and grandma needs to watch her shows at home, then how are you gonna prioritize who has access to that device that day and who doesn't? 
And even within households, we're seeing that there is an inequity or a lack of access that is impacting the day to day. And so this next piece is really important. We're seeing an increase in smartphones, iPhones, Androids, all that fun stuff. And so we're seeing more and more people relying on their smartphones uh, to complete classes, to complete forms, uh, because they don't have a desktop at home. It's been proven that learning on a wide screen, so about 13 inches and upwards, um, there is a higher increase in retaining information, education, and literacy. So overall, learning works way better on a wide screen. It is not effective when it comes to learning on smartphones um, if you're 100% relying on that. So what does that mean? It means that if you have been currently laid off due to COVID-19, if your restaurant or if your store has had a current, has had to have a hiatus and shut down, um, that means that you have to apply for unemployment, right? You have to go to the website and calling in is just not effective. People are waiting hours, people are waiting days just to get through to a human and try to talk through the situation and more and more people are recommending that they go through the online platform. And so if you only own a smartphone or if your home internet isn't, you know, super fast, you'll be waiting in line for a very long time. And if you're using your smartphone to access these forms and to fill it out, you will be unable to make a, other calls, to use it for other things, and you'll just kind of be trapped in the cycle of kind of waiting your turn at the line. And so um, one recent study that was um, tested about 2018, 2019, showed that 86% of government websites are not mobile friendly. So you don't pass the test for being able to use smartphones to fill out unemployment forms, uh, food supplement benefits, etc. So it's just not an effective way to move forward through life as your only source of uh, internet access or access to a device. And so when we're thinking about these same communities um, that are suffering through the digital divide, who are already experiencing tons and tons of inequity already, and then on top of that, they don't have access to internet at home, what does that mean now that we're sheltered at home? Well, with COVID-19, everything is online. The census has moved online. A lot of these places and spaces that we're doing, you know, walk-in appointments um, are now moving to an online platform. And so if you don't have access to this internet, I cannot stress enough, you're at a disadvantage. You're at a disadvantage when it comes to um, falling for disinformation or misinformation through social media. You won't be aware of where food distribution sites because that's online. Um, social media has definitely increased, but if you're not super into Facebook or Twitter, how are you accessing your information aside from, you know, television or the news? And that's hoping that you have access to cable at home. And so what we're seeing is that the same communities who have historically been disenfranchised are now getting disenfranchised through the digital divide and that they have a lack of health access, of quality education access. And so we're seeing that more and more communities are disconnected and falling deeper and deeper into the shelter. And so I think it's important to note that there are uh, five communities in Baltimore City alone that are facing the greatest gap when it comes to digital, digital services. And I'm going to shout them out real quick. And that is Cherry Hill, Greenmount West, Clifton Barria, Walbrook, and Arlington. And so those places, uh, based off of a recent uh, study done by the Baltimore Neighborhoods Indicators Alliance, I hope I got that right, um, showed that those neighborhoods that I just listed are above 45% of those populations um, lack internet access. So that means that within those several blocks uh, radius, we're seeing a higher percentage of folks within those neighborhoods without access to technology or wireline internet. And so if you're familiar with Green Mount West, Clifton Barrier, all these neighborhoods, these are the same neighborhoods that if you go to the Baltimore Sun right now are the same neighborhoods with the highest rate of the current coronavirus. Um, let me say those communities one more time. That is Cherry Hill, Green Mount West, Clifton Barrier, Robert Junction in Arlington. I also want to add um, Mount Claire to the list as well because that is another, another neighborhood that is impacted through the digital divide. Um, next slide, please. So I bet all that information really bummed you out. Um, I want to be clear that when we're talking about data and information, we need to know what we're working with in order to make a successful and sustainable long-term plan for how we um, correct this digital issue. And so one thing that I want to highlight is that there is an organization called the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. They are a national um, advocacy group that is primarily focused on um, creating equitable uh, and sustainable internet and device access policies and to work with communities directly on how to solve it. Um, when I'm talking about digital equity, 
their definition is that um, digital equity is a condition in which individuals and communities have information, have information tech capacity that are needed for full participation in society. So digital equity is not just, I'm gonna give you a laptop. It's not just, I'm gonna call Comcast to have them install internet. And it's not just, I'm gonna sign you up for a digital literacy class. Digital equity is a multi-pronged approach that must work hand in hand with other institutions in order for it to be successful. Let me say that again. In order for digital equity to be successful, we must work together within other institutions um, and other industries to find success. Digital equity and digital inequity does not exist in a bubble. If you do not have access to strong internet, that means that you do not have access to health resources. And that means that you won't be able to go to a doctor. And that increases the health and medical inequity. That means that if you're without internet, your kids cannot attend classes. That increases the low literacy rates. That increases the college and high school dropout rates. This is all interconnected. And because we're living in this new society, it's important that we see that digital equity goes hand in hand with racial equity, with health equity, with socio and economic equity. And so what can we do, right? What are some simple steps that we can do um, today and in the future to make sure that we are setting up not only our children, ourselves, and our grandparents for success in this digital age? And so if you're a parent and you're, you're sort of comfortable leaving your like five-year-old with YouTube while you're doing the dishes, that's totally okay. What I would recommend is that for parents and for adults, we need to redefine our relationship to technology. For a very long time, technology has been seen as a priority. It's been seen as a luxury. I know my mom told me growing up, the reason why your grades like that is because you always on that phone. Well, it's time for us to really get acquainted with our phones. We need to get acquainted with technology and in the ways in which it could be useful and not a distraction. Um, I know a lot of these articles about, you know, screen time um, and being on our phones too frequently is scary stuff. And there's, so there needs to be a healthy way that we moderate our, uh, our internet usage and our technology to make sure that we are using it effectively. Um, and that we are creating both an online and a physical learning zone. Technology is not just, I'm going to um, put this video up for 15 minutes and it's gonna be fun. As a parent, you want to make sure that it's both physical and online. So if your kid is watching an online unboxing video and it's a bunch of slime and it's super cool, after they're done watching that video, let's make some slime. And I know every parent in the room is like, we don't need any more slime in this house. But if you're really looking to teach chemicals and science and make it fun, that is one way to incorporate online learning into physical um, engagement and to connect deeper with your, with your children. For students, it's so important that we hear your voices when it comes to getting better access to internet and technology. We're in a world where digital inequity impacts all of us in very different ways. Um, the older you are, you're dealing with a different set of circumstances than if you're a younger student trying to navigate the internet world. And so it's important that we hear from every single generation, every single industry, when it comes to the challenges and solutions that are in place for digital equity. So for any student of any age, I would recommend getting more and more familiar with the current digital landscape, with what policies exist, what our politicians and what our communities are saying about digital equity, and make sure your voices are heard and brought to the forefront when it comes to this, uh, this issue. For nonprofits, we need to work to get those communities online. So the same communities I listed, let me just shout them out again, Cherry Hill, Grand Mount West, Clifton Barrier, Walbrook, Arlington, and Mount Clare, those communities are in most in need of getting connected. Those are also the same communities that are in need of other sort of solutions and innovative practices. I would not recommend ever going into a community and saying, I know exactly what to do to solve your problem. I have all the answers. I think it's important that communities, especially from these neighborhoods, voices are heard when it comes to their specific issues with internet. Is it because they can't afford a plan? Is it because they don't know where to go? Is it because they're not familiar with it? Is it because they have something but don't know what to be looking for? We need to figure out what communities are saying about their lack of connection and work with them hand in hand to make sure they have it. This is not a sort of savior piece. Um, this is a space where we need to really work hand in hand with communities to get, make sure it's a community oriented approach rather than a band-aid to a leg wound. And so communities, one more time, Cherry Hill, Fremont West, Clifton Barrio, Walbrook, Arlington, and Mount Clare are communities that are already doing amazing work on the ground. And it's important that we get them connected in various ways and in the safest way possible. Another piece is that for nonprofits right now, 
if we are providing census materials, if we are providing food, if we are providing additional services for communities during times of COVID, we must be working with them to provide internet access and laptop access. It's important that we work and do this hand in hand to make sure this is a multi-pronged solution and not a siloed approach to an issue. And so if you're a community that is offering an online program and you're noticing that your participants aren't signing up for some reason, it's probably because they don't have internet. So how can you connect with organizations that are providing that? And then three, this is my favorite part. There is a coalition called the Baltimore Digital Equity Coalition. It was founded about a month ago from Libraries Without Borders, Fight Back, and PCs for People uh, to expand digital equity uh, and to bridge the gap of the digital divide. And so we are working to do this in four sectors. One, how can we increase broadband access and make it affordable? Two, how can we make sure that communities and different neighborhoods have access to devices? Three, how can we advocate for better policies and more equitable um, solutions that are targeted to communities in need? And then the fourth piece is about digital literacy. So how can we make sure that once you receive your device or your wireline internet that you know exactly how to do it so that you're empowered to own it yourself? It's important that when it comes to any sort of equity, it's about empowerment. We're not here to be a tech support or a geek squad. What, are, what we're here to do is provide the tools, the resources, the information necessary to get someone online and for them to do whatever they want and need with that access. I'm not here to tell communities what they need to do and neither should we. What we should be doing is working together to provide this resource. And so here at Libraries Without Borders, we are working to distribute uh, laptops and prepaid Wi-Fi hotspots to about 200 families across Baltimore City. There is no eligibility. There is no um, limit based on households. We understand that if one household is in need of a laptop, that means three people in that, in that household are in need of a laptop. And so there are also a ton of other organizations all collaborating and working together to solve the digital divide. And so if you're a nonprofit, if you are a foundation, if you're a community member, if you are a parent, you need to join this coalition. And we have our next meeting today at 5 p.m. And if you click on that link or type it in or click on the link in the chat, you can sign up and you'll be invited to our next meeting. And so this meeting, we're gonna be talking a lot about broadband access and to get people more cued in onto what's needed. You don't need to be like a tech wizard. You don't need to be Mr. Robot to really understand the digital inequities and to care about it for your communities. Because as we see, digital equity and digital inequity affects us all. And so we need to get reconnected and connect to those that are experiencing the most disconnect. Uh, next slide, please. And here are all the cool sources. So if you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend reading the full 30 page report from the ABLE Foundation. It's super fascinating to learn about what the intricacies are. The Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance is just a great data tool in general, if you're curious about your specific neighborhoods and the different factors that impact it. There's also another great report done by the Media Democracy Fund and the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation around digital equality and digital equity uh, from 2017, 2018. Um, it's about a 15 page report um, from interviews from various uh, industries and sections um, around how we can solve the digital divide in Baltimore City. And if you're curious, if you wanna ask questions, if you wanna learn more about our tech program, about our other programs, or about joining the Baltimore Digital Equity Coalition, my email is azure, A-Z-U-R-E, at libraries.borders.us. So feel free to contact me, I'm very friendly, and I'll be happy to talk through uh, what digital equity means for you and your communities. And I think that's my time. <laughs> Thank you, Azure. We're going to um, keep this rolling. Um, if you have questions, please add them to the Q&A section. We'll get to as many as we can at the end of um, the last presentation. So now we're here from Dr. Sasanya Jones. Take it away, Dr. Jones. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, today I'll be talking about um, equity as it pertains to higher education. So I can go on to the slide now. So I'll be talking about um, some of the challenges and the responses to those challenges and what you can do um, in terms of addressing inequity in higher ed um, as it's exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, currently, we're in an unprecedented time. Um, there was a pandemic before, but at the time, 
um, higher ed wasn't nearly as large as it is now. We're at a moment in time where higher ed is the most populated it's ever been. We have the most um, students, we have the most faculty and staff, um, and an unprecedented amount of institutions of higher ed. So this um, circumstance, this crisis has really called attention to a lot of the weaknesses in higher ed, um, ways in which higher ed is not um, serving various populations. Um, and, and equities within the very institutions that serve a disproportionate amount of students of color in particular and other marginalized populations. Um, in particular, HBCUs um, are getting hit very hard by this pandemic um, because they were already under-resourced and underfunded. Um, and so they're asked to do more with less and um, it's really having a ripple effect for the students that they serve. One of the examples is um, Howard University, which a lot of people associate with um, wealth and prestige is actually, you know, it is very prestigious, but in terms of its peer institutions, particularly predominantly white institutions, um, it's severely underfunded and just this semester alone has caused a $12 million hit in tuition. Um, and Howard doesn't have the endowments that many of the PWI schools have. And it's one of the most elite of the HBCUs. So you can imagine the effect this pandemic has had on some of our less resourced public HBCUs that don't have the same prestige and funding as Howard. Um, and so we need to talk about how can we help support and sustain those institutions so they can keep serving the students that they serve. Uh, the next slide. So one of the things I really want to highlight today um, is kind of um, breaking down some of the the stereotypes that people have about college students. I think the media does a great job of crafting this narrative that if you go to college, you've kind of arrived, you made it. Um, and there's a, a imagining of what a college student looks like right now that very much is very privileged um, and is usually very white um, and that they are having fun, right? They're partying, they're in frats, um, they're drinking. And that is our, our living image of what a college student is like. And that image masks a lot of different populations that are actually participating in college. So if you take away anything today, I want you to think about all of the different ways that colleges serve different populations and who's not being represented in terms of how we picture college students. Um, so we know that most college students are not, um, right now, they are not white. Uh, so college students are serving a lot of students of color. And because of that, there's a lot of intersectionality with other issues because students of color are disproportionately from um, homes that are less wealthy um, and less equipped to participate in higher education because of historic inequities. And so we see that 58% of college students have experienced some kind of housing insecurity before the pandemic. These are the numbers, almost half didn't know necessarily if they were going to be able to stay where they're actually were supposed to be staying. 16% of college students have experienced homelessness and that was before the pandemic. Um, then we have subpopulations of students that we hardly ever talk about, foster students. Before the pandemic, only 20% attended college and only 9% graduated. So we have a, a whole bunch of different types of students that were already struggling before, and now we're kind of cut off from them um, because of what Azura was talking about, is that 
these things aren't in silo categories. If you are in underserved neighborhoods and a member of an underserved population, there's a chance you probably don't have access to digital technology so you can stay in tune, so you can represent yourself. And so we're currently in the dark about many of the populations that are the most vulnerable. They don't have a voice necessarily because maybe they don't have access to technology. And so another important group is LGBTQ students. Before the pandemic, 50% of all LGBTQ youth said their families made them feel bad about themselves and only one fourth reported being comfortable at home. So what does it mean to be shut in, in a place where you're not accepted for who you are? What does that look like? Um, are people do are people safe? Do they feel safe? How do you do work in that environment? Um, and then we have our international students, students who are mostly self-funded, who come over here and have no access to financial aid, and now they have to either go home um, before they before they were forced home or they're stranded here. A lot of students actually are stranded here in the US, um, but they don't necessarily have access to the support that some other students have. And so um, a lot of these students don't have a way to communicate and represent themselves. And so they're forgotten about. Next slide, please. So, of course, housing insecurity is very much related to food insecurity. 33% of college students experienced food insecurity before the pandemic. Um, in fact, that number is very conservative. We know that um, food pantries have been popping up all around the country at various colleges, and they can't keep those food pantries stocked because college students really are starving to be at college. Sometimes they have to choose between paying the rent or paying for textbooks and getting groceries. Um, and because a lot of that's related to the, the cost of college has gone up exponentially. The cost of college today is almost a new Mercedes Benz every single year. Um, and that was not the case 20 years ago. So college students are sent home right now. They have to find a job to qualify for welfare to get groceries. And if you can't find a job in some states, you don't qualify for welfare. And as Congresswoman uh, Marcia Fudge says, food insecurity was already a problem on college campuses across the country before the pandemic. And we need to get students help before it turns into a full-blown full crisis. And I would argue that it's already a full-blown crisis. Um, but the problem is we don't know how bad it is because of the way we've been cut off from these most vulnerable populations. Next slide, please. So related to all of this, um, these things are all interrelated, is job and wage loss. 70% of college students worked full time before the pandemic. And we, had, we know that we're at a time of historic unemployment. And of that population, we have a significant portion of college students who were single parents. Four million undergraduates and more than one in five college students were single parents. Um, and they were already facing disproportionate economic insecurity, difficulty meeting basic needs, and significant time and caregiving demands. And so what does it look like now um, when you have been either fired or laid off of your job, or you're in a central working position, what does childcare look like? And then how do you continue to do your college work? Do you even have that option? And then we have our low SES socioeconomic students from um, low socioeconomic backgrounds. 81% face financial difficulties, and that's outside of paying tuition for next year. 
a lot of people are thinking about just dropping out right now because it's about ba getting basic needs met. Um, and more than a quarter have trouble paying their bills, keeping the lights on, paying rent. And, you know, a lot of states have sub suspended the rent payments, but that doesn't mean the rent payments aren't going to be due. That requirement is still going to be there when the, the um, provision to suspend the rent payment is over. And a lot of people won't be able to pay that. Next slide. So all of this is intersectional, right? These categories aren't distinct. They're very much overlapping and integrated and they conflate. And so we have black and brown college students um, who they report a much higher level rate of all of these issues of food and housing insecurity of job loss. 33% of Black students are having trouble covering food costs. Now, this is before the pandemic. All of this is before because right now we're in the middle of it. In terms of data collection, we really don't know how bad this pandemic has exacerbated some of these issues. But we do know 22% of Black students with housing expenses in the same categories um, suffer with the same issues. And so that also goes for the Hispanic students. These issues are affecting people across the board. And so this is very much about race. This is very much about economic class. This transcends um, gender as well. And so we have to think about this when, when we're working in a nonprofit or we're working as an advocate, who are we speaking for? Who are we missing? Who aren't we representing, right? Um, and sometimes these populations are hidden. Next slide, please. So this is a great case. The case of Marcus Diago, it's a success story, but it also highlights how these things are intersectional. So Marcus Diego, this was featured in the Chronicle of Social Change. He rotated, he is a foster child. He rotated between 14 different foster homes. Um, and he was enrolled in Queens College and he received a special stipend and funding to go to college through a special fund. Now he woke up one day and found out that he had to vacate the dorms within two days. And that happened across the nation. Many students got a notice that they had to vacate the, their dorms within two to five days with very little notice. Um, so he faced three possible outcomes. Um, he could either um, declare that he might go homeless and, and be kept in the dorm, he will have to plead a case for that. He will have to maintain his foster care status and go to a group home or a foster parent home. And that could be a new foster home where he didn't know the parents at all. And that only is if they would take him. You have to remember he was 18. Um, and so if you age out of the foster care system, um, they promise to find housing for you with relatives, but what happens when you don't have relatives or relatives aren't really the healthiest people to be with? Um, so in Marcus' case, he and the, a few of the other students protested and pled their case and they were allowed to stay in the dorms, but he represents um, students who represent a number of groups, black and brown, foster care students, um, low SES, and some of them were not allowed to plead their case. Um, and so where do they go? Where have they gone? We still don't know in many cases. So the next slide. So there's also the issue of physical and mental health. We know students who are in marginalized um, communities um, suffer disproportionately um, from lack of access to health care, but also stigma around getting emotional support and uh, just 
a lack of availability and awareness of where to get this type of social psycho support they need. And so this is problematic because we know students from marginalized communities are more likely to be at risk for COVID because of all of these issues. Um, and so what happens when you're at the most high risk for catching the virus, but you have the least amount of access to care, especially quality care. Um, and then what does that do to your, your mental state? How, how are you taking care of yourself and who's taking care of you, right? And so 80% of college students said the pandemic negatively affected their mental health. And we don't even know who they surveyed in that survey. And I would, I would venture that if you're surveying marginalized populations, that, that percent would be um, much higher. And one in five students said their mental health has significantly worsened under COVID-19. And something we're not talking about, the effects of being shut in, and in many cases, cut off from support systems. How does that affect one's mental health? And then how do you actually engage in college classrooms digitally when you're suffering from a mental health issue? Um, and so we have a lot of competing issues that um, people are dealing with. Um, okay, I'm running out of time. So I just wanna say takeaways. Um, when you're doing your work, whatever that work is, please don't forget these populations. Please don't um, discount someone because they're in college that they, you know, arrived or they're in a different uh, uh, particular social class and they don't need support. And use your voice to talk about these different populations, especially through social media and writing your representative. But also, like Azur said, we can't assume we know what's going on with people. We have to talk to them. We have to get their stories, empower them to talk about what's going on, and then help them highlight what's going on so that they can get support from our policymakers. A lot of a lot of um, policy is going on right now being written about how can we support various groups that are being hurt by this crisis. We gotta make sure that these populations have a voice when those bills are being written. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jones. Um, please, if you have questions, please include them in the Q&A. Um, we're going to hear now from, um, from Dr. Brenda Kelly. Good evening again, afternoon. I, I'm just so grateful for the uh, panelists that have gone on before me. Uh, thank you, Ms. Grimes, for setting it up and Dr. Jones for um, those numbers and talking about uh, what's actually going on on the college campuses. Uh, I would like to um, talk to you about what's going on in the, the at, at the beginning, the um, elementary school level children. But so, um, next slide. So before the um, coronavirus 19, we found that many school districts were already struggling to provide an equitable education for all learners. Those learners, the special ed, um, the ones who were mentally and um, intellectually challenged, those students who are English as a second language, um, children who are poor and in disadvantaged communities, they were already having chronic, chronic underfunding. So it's to the point that it's really has taken its toll. So public, um, public, public schools actually lack the resources, many of them lack resources and the critical personnel support necessary to meet these needs of these vulnerable students and populations. So I want to uh, actually tune in and, and on the, the word equity. What does that mean? Um, what does it look like in a public school? Fairness, freedom from bias or favoritism. Uh, we need to think about what it what it really means and is 
is that, it, do we see equity on a national level? Do we see it on a district level, school, even in the classroom? And right down to the individual. Next slide. So what I'd like to do is talk to you about the holistic point of view here. You know, uh, Dr. Jones really honed in on it when she talked about um, college students and how even them going back home now might not even be comfortable in their own homes. Well, Andrew Maslow, he was a, a psychologist in, his, in a paper in 1943, came up with this pyramid of um, hierarchy. Here, we're looking at the lower part of that pyramid, uh, the most basic needs are food, water, warmth, and rest. And then we go up just to that, the very next uh, rung of that ladder, to safety and security. And we can actually just stop there. But you see, in order for a child to get up to the fulfillment of just being um, understanding himself, herself, self-actualization, self he has to get up to that um, hierarchy. So let's just talk about what are, are the problems here is keeping us from getting into that hierarchy. Next slide. So here it is. We are really not meeting the basic needs. It's been talked about before with both panelists. Uh, just looking at the problem here in um, public school, the public school data, and before I, before I go into the, the different data, I, I want to just explain to you what we, who we are. We are the parents, we are the teachers, the administrators, the community leaders, the policy makers, the, the church um, organizers, the community organizers, that's who we are. And um, Ms. Grimes actually talked about it when she said that we, you know, we're all in this together. We cannot, not one of us can do any of this by ourselves. But let's just look at some data that is, um, uh, pretty, pretty, pretty sad when you, when you really look at it and bring it home. The homelessness, these are people who have insecurity, insecurity homeless, meaning that um, they are homeless, not without a home at all, or like the, the young man that was talked about with Dr. Jones, he had a home, but now he's in a place to where he had to actually fight to stay in the dorm. So let's look at these numbers. Homelessness, this was 2018-2019 um, data. In DC, there were 7,445 families. And I am talking about uh, public school age children, families that were homeless. In Virginia, 20,393 families homeless or home insecurities. In Maryland, there were 17,601,000. Now, that is a lot of people that are, have home insecurities. But now let's look at the childcare and, I, and we will go in, in uh, further into that as um, I go throughout the presentation. But the childcare in Maryland, and these are for children, who are infant in infant care, the child care in Maryland is $15,335 for a year. In DC, $10,254,000 a year. And Virginia, $14,063 a year. Now, of course, going back to the homeless, if you're homeless, you're also food insecure. You have food deserts, as Ms. Grimes talked about. But look at the, the, the numbers here for those who are food insecure. In Maryland, 
there was 15%, 15.2% of the children in Maryland are food insecure. And Virginia, 13.2%. And DC, 21.2% children who are food insecure. So here we go down to the basic levels, back to the Maslow's um, hierarchy, the basic levels of food, water, warmth, and rest, and safety and security. You have all of these numbers, high numbers, percentage, who right now are just without that, um, just the basic physiological needs that a child needs in order to um, be successful in school or be successful in life, period. Next slide, please. So we talked about the problem. So what is the solution? And this is a, a lot of what we can do too. We have to, first of all, take care of the whole child. Who, again, are we? We are the parents, the teachers, the administrators, the neighbors, the community leaders, the policymakers. We are all in this together. We have to take care of the child to make sure that those basic needs are, are taken care of. We have, um, we, we have to have um, clean water, clean air, food. A child needs to feel safe, not only physically, but mentally. And then that part of belonging. Um, you know, we talk about inclusion, but why should we have even the word inclusion? Inclusion means that, okay, I'm better than you, so I'm going to include you to make you feel like you're part of the family. When we need to feel like we all belong, in which we do, we are all in this together. And what do we need to do? We need to build self-esteem, and achieve potential lifelong, um, um, that's a lifelong process to do that. So I want you to look over at this, um, the circled part of this. This um, actually starts from the very beginning and as you can see, it right in the center is the, the child, the individual. And you know, first of all, we need to stop the blame game. It's not the teacher's fault, it's not the parent's fault, it's not anybody's fault when someone is in need of help. Every human is entitled to clean air. Every human is entitled to clean food. Every human is entitled to water and a shelter. Every child should feel like they belong and not um, put aside. So looking right at the center, here we are working with the child, and then we have to go out into the community, uh, work with family, schools, the um, religious institutions, health services, and peers. All of that, we are interacting, at, we heard it over and over again in each uh, presentation. We are interacting in and out with each other to make our communities what they need to be. So what is it? What is it that we need to do? Well, first of all, I, um, I am just a, an advocate and a promoter of early childhood education. Uh, we in the United States have our children start school at five years old. And at five years old, uh, what usually happens at five, you've learned a lot between zero and five years old. And in some of our communities, what we are learning are, are negative behaviors. So we need to have our children in schools to learn, um, first of all, just how to um, take care of problem solving situations. We need to, we need to really promote uh, early childhood education because Research shows, tells us that 90% of a child's um, brain is developed before they are five years old. So then we take them to school at five and many parents will say, okay, now they're at school now, so you teach them how to read, you teach them how to write. Well, if they have not been um, 
read to at home before five years old, if they don't have pencils and papers at home before five years old, it's almost like we are bringing them to a race that has already started and they are already behind. So I highly promote um, early childhood education for that. Um, just to show you the slides and, and how we interact in and out, we have to change our attitudes about um, just what, what, is, what is going on in the culture. And that also has been talked about uh, earlier in, in the presentations. Our attitudes need to be changed and we as a community need to get involved um, outside of our communities. I just want to home back on, um, you know, I talked about how we are to promote our children and our, and our family. I am, I am from the, the age category to where we knew our neighbors. Um, and if we did something, like if we were coming home from school and something happened before we got home, our parents knew about it because our neighbors, you know, they didn't have, uh, they didn't have cell phones so they could text the parents, but somehow or another, our parents knew. So we need to get back into that community involvement. Also, um, we need to involve our religious institutions with what we're doing, having Saturday school, evenings, um, night school for our children, because it really does become to the point to where um, it's too, it gets to be too much for one person to do. Going back, talking about this pandemic and the homelessness rate, and I think Dr. Jones talked about it too, you know, the, the rate that um, we are seeing with homelessness before the pandemic, imagine what it will be after the pandemic. So it's just, um, it seems like a lot for us to do, but we are all in this together and um, we must strive to work together one and hand in hand to help each other. Um, I believe I you think um, I'm going to stop there. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. I believe that you had um, a couple of resources that we'll be sharing um, when we send out uh, Why We Stay Home. Um, and 25 ways for kids to get moving at home. So we'll share that out when we send out the slides. And we recognize that COVID-19 brought us to this conversation, but um, these issues certainly predated um, COVID-19. And so, um, let's see, do we have any questions, um, Anjaniki? Um, are we ready to wrap up? I know that uh, some answered the questions in the chat. Yeah, I think some of the questions were answered in the chat, but it, some of them uh, are good to just kind of ask out loud um, so that everybody can hear the answers and some people may be having a similar question. Um, one person wrote, we are a small nonprofit for a free Saturday morning children's arts program and um, our students lack access to internet and transportation is an issue for some of our families. What suggestions do you have to meet the needs while we cannot hold in-person events? And um, this one, I think, um, goes to, to Azure, but certainly I welcome others to chime in, but maybe we can start with her. Yeah, this is a tricky one for sure. Um, with COVID-19 kind of shifting and adapting the way we do programming, we've really had to be really innovative with the way that we uh, provide these sort of resources. So my first question um, always when it comes to providing services or programs and resources for the community is that have you asked them why, what the best assets and resources would help them. What is the best way to receive these art supplies and art programs? Is it directly at their doors? Is it meeting at a public space six feet away? Um, what sort of needs are we working with and what assets do they already have? Do they have a device? And maybe it's about 10 years old, but it can still use a DVD player. Do they have a TV with a USB port? Is there a way for you to add, you know, how-to videos or specific uh, worksheets or things to a USB port and to be able to provide that directly to families so they have 
have that without needing internet to use? Is there a way to create a DVD or a CD or a packet that can be dropped off directly at the door? Um, with internet and lack of internet access being a challenge, it's time to like go back to the low tech days where we did deliveries and we printed out things and provided it in a safe and secure way um, as not to try to cross contaminate or to use services. Um, but my first question and probably my greatest answer for you is to ask them directly how they would like to receive those resources and work around their needs. And it's going to be really hard. I know capacity is an issue with nonprofits nowadays, but try to figure out how you can make sure that you're meeting people where they are literally and to work your programs and adapt your programs around uh, their specific assets. Thank you. Any other responses or any other questions? Yes, we did have a question about mesh networks. Um, someone wanted to ask, what is a mesh network and um, how are you seeing the increase uh, in use of those? Who wants to take that one? I don't know. I could take that. <laughs> Sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot. So, um, the very service level definition of a mesh network is, um, so a regular wireline Wi-Fi um, is one that you can install within your home and that typically uh, people that are within your home can use, uh, sometimes outside of your neighborhood, but you know, typically within a household. What a mesh network will do is it will take one single Wi-Fi network and extend it to other locations so that multiple people within potentially a three mile radius can all connect to the same Wi-Fi network without having to leave their couches. And so mesh networks is an idea that the Baltimore Digital Equity Coalition, specifically the Digital Harbor Foundation has been really advocating for. So if you're interested in learning more or want a clear definition, I would recommend reaching out to the Digital Harbor Foundation, specifically Andrew Coy and Admin Bowman, who have been installing mesh networks inside of Sandtown uh, for the last several weeks or so. So they'd be the most helpful and the biggest experts when it comes to mesh networks in Baltimore City. So Azure, would you add their information in the chat, please? Mm -hmm, I can. Also, I noticed that um, um, one of our uh, board members, Kate McGuire, said that we're helping nonprofits plan virtual or kit-based summer STEM activities and programming. So um, we'll be uh, sending out Kate's um, STEM of Champions of Baltimore information. Um, who's excited about helping. Um, so that information will go out um, um, as well in the resources. Any other questions, Anjaniki? Not at this time. I think now is probably a good time to get final takeaways. Okay, so if we, I first of all, just wanna thank um, each one of you for your great presentations. And, um, and to our audience who's watching and listening. Um, so as we wrap up, uh, panelists, would you give us one takeaway um, um, that um, you'd like to leave people with or one hope for the future? Uh, let's start with, um, let's start with uh, Dr. Jones. Well, uh, I guess my one takeaway is that um, they're all, there are always populations that aren't necessarily visible that we have to keep in mind when we work in advocacy. Um, and that also we need to think about ways we can collaborate um, because usually the populations we serve don't fall into one group. Um, they have intersectional identities. And so there are convergent interests and needs and that we can all help each other more um, by putting our heads together and pulling our resources to support each of our groups. Thank you. Dr. Kelly? Yes, um, one takeaway from me is, you know, I mean, when you look at these numbers and when you hear about what's going on in our communities, you have to ask yourself the question, where is the hope? And so I think about that um, starfish poem about the boy who is at the beach and throwing the starfish back in the water. And uh, the old man comes and asks him, what is he doing? And he says, look at all of these starfish. You can't, you can't save them all. 
and the boy picks up the starfish and throws one into the water and he says, well, I saved that one. Well, we have to ask ourselves, um, you know, where are we in this? Because for us, it's, it's a pandemic, you know? So where are we? Are we the boy who is helping to save someone? Or are we the, the man who's criticizing on the side? Or are we the starfish? So we have to ask and, and at least put ourselves into it and do um, what Nike tells us to do. Just do it. You know, there, there's, there's something you can do to, for us all to work together. So just roll your sleeves up and do something. No, we can't solve every issue. We cannot solve every problem, but we can do something. And if all of us are in it, in it to do something, then something will get done. Thank you. Thank you. Azure, I'll give you the final comment. Yeah, oh my God, I have so much to say, but I will, I will leave it to one thing. Um, and that is, I hope to one day live in a world uh, where being black, where being brown, where being lower income is not an automatic indicator of failure or a challenging circumstance. I wanna live in a world where, you know, despite the various differences and uniqueness, we all have the same opportunities to succeed. That future is very far in advance, and so we have to live in the right now. And right now, we are working uh, in a world where infrastructure, where policies, um, and where historically Black, Brown, and lower income people have been left you know, to the wolves, have been left to fend for themselves for a very long time. And it's important to note that when we're working together, when we're collaborating, and as we should, right, we shouldn't exist in silos, we shouldn't be doing things by ourselves. A lot of amazing people are doing a lot of great work. And if I could, leave you with one thing is that communities are not helpless. Communities have been doing just fine without us being there. What they need is additional support. What they need is funding. What they need is connections and opportunities to find success without it coming off as being a savior or as a hero, because we are not. We are human beings helping other human beings uh, that have existed in silos for far too long. And it's time to reconnect those that have been disconnected, including ourselves from the communities that we're serving. So be better, be good, uh, work together, love each other, and let's live in a world where racism, uh, sexism, misogyny, and all the isms and phobics no longer exist so that we can get some work done. Thank you. I want to thank each one of um, our panelists um, for your uh, dynamic presentations. And just remember what equity is all about. It's about it's about fairness and justice and the opportunity to be able to live out your full potential um, no matter um, who you are, we want you to be safe um, as you re-enter um, the workforce or your community, do it safely. We want to be healthy together. Um, we thank you for uh, your time. We look forward to uh, being back with you in a couple of weeks. Keep um, your eye on, the, um, on our website where we'll be sharing uh, more information about our upcoming webinar series. Thank you again. And think about it. What kind of world do you want to live in? And let's get to work. Take care. See you next time.